And, you know, I, I don't think I know anyone. I, I, I know Susa Lee, but everybody else, I think you're new. So good afternoon. I'm very happy to see you. My name is Aya Santa Chita, and I'm originally from Austria. I live in a small place called the Aloka Earthroom, just on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's about 20 miles uh, north of San Francisco. And, you know, I'm a nun since over 30 years and started my nun's career, if one can call it that thing, in the Thai forest tradition with Archan Buddha Dasa in the late 80s. And then trained with the Archon Char lineage in England for about 16 years with Archon Sumedo and the Siladara Sangha. And then in 2009, I was invited together with Ayananda Bodhi, who also sometimes teaches as SFTC, was invited to come over to uh, the West Coast to open a, a training monastery for women. And that has been what we were doing. And uh, recently we gave up that monastery, which was in the Sierra foothills, because we almost burned down and we felt it wasn't sustainable because it's getting so dry there. And we're getting older, also drying up a little. So we couldn't, we didn't feel we had the powers, you know, to keep that thing safe. And and, you know, being spurred on by the whole uh, poly crisis and the climate crisis in particular, I decided to uh, start with this Aloka Earth Room, which is a contemporary temple space, weaving together Dharma, ecology, and art. And that's where I'm sitting now, right now in that room. If you're interested, you can look it up on my website, if you like. And maybe Noam can put a link into the chat about that. And uh, yeah, I've been teaching at the San Francisco Dharma Collective and before also when it was the, uh, uh, the, the how was it called before Noam? Against the Stream. Against the Stream. I was teaching there already as well. So it's a long standing relationship. And over the last few sessions, I was sharing with uh, the people here um, about what's called the four protective meditations. And today is the last one of those four, which I want to share, which is on death, actually, you know. And in a way, one time is coming to an end. So I thought this was quite interesting that that would be the last one I'm sharing before coming back next year. And before we go more into detail, I'd like to, as usual, you know, offer the five precepts. And, you know, if you have never done the five precepts, you might just want to observe, not just jump in, not knowing what that is, but just observing. And if you are ready, then please come along. And Noam is going to screen share in the five precepts. And Nom, if you can, then when we come to the precepts and to the refugees, if you can then unmute yourself. So can we do call and response? So I just start with the Namo Tassa. And whoever likes to join in, you're welcome. That's called homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato. Arahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa And now, Nom, can you unmute yourself and respond to the... Um, <clears throat> refugees and precepts with me okay yes thank you Bhutang Sarananga Chami Bhutang Sarananga Chami Dhammang Sarananga Chami Dhammang Sarananga Chami Sankang Sarananga Chami Sankam Saranam Gachami Dutiampi Putang Saranam Gachami 
Dutyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dutyampi Tamang Saranam Gachami. Dutyampi Dhamam Saranam Gachami. Dutyampi Sankang Saranam Gachami. Dutyampi Sankam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Bhutang Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Bhutam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Tamang Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Damam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sankang Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami. Okay, now you could scroll up. Thank you. And now I'm going to read the precept in English and then you could all repeat it after me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Do you want me to say that loud? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes, yeah. please. Yes, please. No. I take the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikapatani silena sukatinyanti silena boga sampata silena niputinyanti tasma silang visotaye. Thank you for taking the precepts and in that way, you know, giving the gift of fearlessness to the world, which is a very, very precious gift. So much needed at this time and every time. So please, you know, let's find our way into this meeting by just allowing your Oh, your breath, you know, to take you into the body and noticing how you are, how you're feeling right now. I have been this morning on the arms, I've been on arms round on the farmer's market here in San Rafael, you know, collecting food offerings with my arms bowl and then meeting people there, and after that, sitting there in front of the entrance of the farmer's market, sitting for survival, you know, sitting with some signs, asking people, you know, to stop and reflect on the climate crisis and the whole mess we are in at this point in history and we're becoming aware of it and there is a lot of good things happening and not so good things And how important it is at a time like this, you know, to have a teaching which can help us to stay on course. It won't, you know, save us from having difficult experiences, but it can help us to stay on course, going in the right direction, not going in the wrong direction. And using, you know, whatever comes up for learning,
and for wisdom and compassion. So today I'd like to share with you the fourth of the four protective meditations. And those four protective meditations, they are a set of meditations, you know, which isn't really mentioned as a set in the suttas, but it, it's mentioned later on in Sri Lanka in about the fifth century. This set of four meditations, which is... Uh, it's all about, you know, uplifting the mind and then showing the mind the way things really are, you know, in the attempt to support the mind in letting go. And the two first meditations are about uplift is the recollection of the Buddha. In part, it's called Buddhanusati. And the second one is about metta, loving kindness benevolence meditation so those two you know which uplift and and open the mind wide and then this next two are more about the limitations of embodied life which is the third one is asuba the meditation on the body parts or i have been also teaching the meditation on the elements you know showing us how vulnerable the body is and the body is actually like a riding animal for consciousness, which is borrowed from nature. And which is actually part of the planet. It's not separate. And these bodies of ours, you know, they're a bit of planet, really. And then the last one is, and this is the one we are speaking about today, is the recollection of death. Maranasati in Pali. And that's supposed you know, to give us like a sense of urgency. So those four meditations, they show us, the first two show us the potential and the last two show us the limitations of a human life. Elevating and supporting the man to let go. And they protect us from our own greed, hatred, and delusion and from the greed, hatred, and delusion of others. That's why they're called protective. And they're all about, you know, letting go of old patterns of separation and, you know, allowing space for emergence, for the new to enter into the mind, you know, new ways of responding to the polycrisis, new ways of responding to our own patterns in our mind. And through that, you know, starting to be part of the solution, you know, part of the change, which needs to come through all of us. We can no longer hope, you know, that some kind of big father figures are going to sort it all out for us. These times are end, uh, have ended, really. This uh, approach has proved it, it, it really doesn't work. So we are, you know, at, on the threshold of new ways of understanding ourselves and understanding life on this planet start to emerge and for that we have to let the old ways die and that's a very 
powerful uh, you know place to be very potent you know hospicing that which does no longer work and midwifing that which wants to be born it's a beautiful way of looking at that which is maybe difficult or scary you know to look at at this point And I brought a poem to start us off today from uh, a book of um, reimagined uh, poems, which are based on the enlightenment poems of the early Buddhist nuns. And I have sometimes shared from those. And today I want to share one which is called Sela the Rock. And it spoke, you know, the original poem has been spoken by a Buddhist bhikkhuni, a Buddhist full ordained nun living at the time of the Buddha, around that time, up to 200 years after him. And that's a poem, you know, which she spoke after realizing full awakening. And this is uh, basically a um, contemporary rendering based on that poem by Mary Weingast, a friend of us. Long after the front gate swung closed, behind me, I could still hear them. Why talk so much about death? Find a husband to share your bed. Bring children into the world to leave behind after you have gone. But ever since I invited my own death into bed with me, I no longer feel lonely or afraid of the dark. What do we really bring into the world? What do we leave behind? A gate swings closed, then opens. Where does it come from? Where does it all go? So, you know, somehow death really, you know, prepares us for the vastness from which we emerge. We can say, you know, that the mystery of a baby coming into the world. We don't really know, you know, where is it coming from? But it does come, you know, it is born through a woman basically, you know, splitting her body into two and then giving one comes out basically. And here it is. And then, you know, when the baby grows up and at one point dies again, it goes back into the, the ground, you know, where it actually came from, goes back to the elements. So that mystery is actually really quite awe-inspiring if we allow ourselves, you know, to reflect on it. And uh, it's a very ancient practice, you know, the reflection on death, which we can find in the suttas as the four satipatthana. This is the four establishments of mindfulness, which is the basic uh, foundational meditation teaching, you know, of early Buddhism. And it has four levels. And the first one being mindfulness of the body. The second one being mindfulness of feeling tones. Sec third one being mindfulness of mind states. And then the last one, you know, um, being aware of conditionality, you know, how all of those things are operating together. And, you know, the first foundation, the first establishment on the body is subdivided again in three, in three different practices. The anatomical parts or, and the elements is one. No, the anatomical parts is one, the elements is the second one, and then modality or death is the third one. And that's what we're going to do today. And in, you know, in the ancient uh, tradition, it was mainly done as contemplating corpses, you know, corpses in different states of decay, like nine different ones. And... Uh, it was all about, you know, that 
for the realization to understand that I will also die and also, you know, for understanding is considered the cutting edge of impermanence, really, that contemplation. And it was especially also, you know, for young people who are Dane and are really, you know, having like maybe very healthy bodies and, and you know, powerful bodies that they would also, you know, have that in mind that at one point it's not going to be like this and important not to waste one's time, you know. And yeah, it's considered to, in order to lose one's fear of dying, you know, that if one can reflect on that frequently, that can really help. And then we won't be so completely freaked out, you know, when when it comes to us or when one of our loved ones dies. For example, in my case, you know, I started my path when I was consciously, I would say, you know, when I was 28, when my mother very suddenly died from a horse riding accident. It's now a very long time ago. But that shook me up so completely. Because, you know, I've never really thought about those things before. That I was very, very disoriented after that. Very, you know, kicked a lot of trauma kicked in, I think. And I felt very, very uh, ungrounded and confused you know and then I started to develop that wish you know I would like to find a teacher and then when I started to look around and I didn't really at all think you know it would be any particular religion with a lone a monastic and then things started rolling you know and about one and a half years after my mother died that suddenly you know I I connected with my first teacher then in Thailand that was Ajahn Buddha Dasa and then you know, things started to, to process. and But the death of my mother was really very, very, you know, a real turning point in my life. And, yeah, I think if I would have reflected on death earlier on, I wouldn't have been that, you know, that... Um, unmoored you know after she died but I had never really thought about it so I think it's it's a really important practice and you know it's the same when you are having an examination you don't start to study just like a few days before you, you prepare you know and the same is with the reflection of that because we don't really know when we're going to die it could be actually today or it could be actually our next breath, you know. This is like the real cutting edge contemplation is this could be my last breath. And that, that meditation is also mentioned in the suttas. Could be my last breath. So the art of dying means, you know, to get to get ready for what we have to face anyway at one point. We just don't know when. And if we do it in that spirit, it actually makes us more alive, you know, because it it helps us to not take everything for granted so easily, you know, because it makes us aware now it's actually really true. We don't know what what is actually be my last breath. We don't know. And if we think we know, we, we're deluding ourselves, actually. So that's a, a powerful practice. And... Uh, You know, and, and being with the tension between our survival instinct, which is like, you know, part of having a body, this is part of it, on the one hand, and on the other hand, knowing that there's no doubt about it, that we will die one day. So to, we have both of those, you know, in our system at the same time. And uh, that you know, brings up quite some defense mechanisms, which will be very unconscious, actually. And, and the whole culture, you know, doesn't like to touch on it very much. And the whole culture supports the defense rather than works against it. 
and in the Buddhist uh, training, you know, we have a set of contemplations. They are called the five subjects for frequent recollection, and you know, which monastics should do on an ongoing, regular basis. And of those, you know, one is also reflection on death. So it's it's an important one to work with this unconscious defense mechanism, you know, which operates in two different ways. The first one is like, not me, you know, other people are dying, but I'm not. And, you know, you might think I'm not doing this, but, you know, if I actually watch my mind, I can see that it's operating. You know, there's somehow the, one can see, one can see it in other people, but one often doesn't really relate to oneself until one starts to practice with it. And the second one is uh, pushing death off into the future, you know, not now. Not me and not now. So they, they are the two basic defense mechanisms. And, and the practice, you know, this practice counteracts both of those strategies. And, you know, besides preparing us for dying, it prepares us also for living. Because dying isn't the opposite of living. Dying is just the opposite of being born. Life goes on. And that's also like a, a, something to really um, reflect upon. Because, you know, there's the stream of life and there is like birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. And it can really help us, you know, to set priorities. To really find out what's really important to me. What do I want to, you know, what do I want to set straight before I die? Is there anything, you know, I have put, you know, put off like endlessly? And now if I reflect on my death, I know exactly, you know, if there are things which are unresolved and where I need to do something about it. And, you know, reflecting on death really helps us to forgive others and also to forgive ourselves and to ask for forgiveness. When we think oh, about that, you know. When we think, you know, I might never see that person again. Do I want to hold a grudge or not? Probably not. So it really helps, it, it really initiates a certain way of waking up and becoming more alive. Because it somehow, you know, straight, straight on faces that ignorance of thinking, yeah, death is happening, but I'm not going to die. <laughs> And uh, and it also protects us, you know, from getting so easily lost in the world, you know, like in what whatever the world has to offer, like shopping and a lot of shopping. <laughs> I was yesterday, I was yesterday with a friend, you know, in a mall to look for something which I thought I needed, and I was so it it was so off putting because it was like. The, there was still this Black Friday thing going on. I just thought, no, I'd, I didn't buy anything. I, I mean, she, I said, no, let's just go back. I can't. I just felt really the trance of it was like quite, um, quite um, palpable, you know. And then I thought, no, actually what I have is good enough. I just stay with that, you know. Yeah, because I felt like that, that um, you know, this invention of things which we could need, you know, it's just like really very, very, um, so much waste of, um, so much waste, you know, of mind space and of resources, yeah, it's incredible how 
far we have got in that regard, you know, how we have spun out of what seems reasonable. Yeah. And that's what this uh, reflection on death is really good about, you know, to give us a sense of urgency, to protect ourselves from the influence of that. That's what I felt yesterday. I just get me out of there, you know. It's too crazy. Even it, it didn't look crazy, you know, it was quite elegant and everybody was polite and friendly and everything, but it had like a trance-like quality over everything, you know, which was very hard to point out, you know, for somebody who lives inside of it, doesn't know. The thing is, it felt, makes a lot of sense what's happening there. It's just business, you know, but it, to me, who is going rather rarely to those malls, I just felt like it was like a thick, opaque layer of some kind of deadness, you know, which was enveloping all of this, which which felt really, um, I wanted nothing to do with that, you know. Yeah, so this sense of some vega or sense of urgency, which helps us to set some energy free, you know, to act on our priorities and not just go along, you know, with everything. It propels us towards practicing and seeing more of that, you know, so that we can send, set more energy free for taking us in the right direction. And that can then, you know, really bring some, some a, a quality of calm and groundedness into our lives. Not because, you know, we don't have any problems anymore, but because we have more sense of, I don't waste my energy. I don't kind of run like in circles. At least, you know, it's not easy sometimes, but it's all going in the right direction. That's all we can hope for, you know. Because the path is a long path and we don't know how long it takes, but if we go in the right direction, that's good enough. And it also helps us, you know, then much more easily to face our own death and the death of our loved ones or other people, you know, who are important supports in our life or people we really love. And because it really helps us to you know to not um, lose ourselves in in thinking that somebody else is gonna you know fix all of our problems, some kind of a savior figure or some kind of a authority figure or somebody else is going to do it because we see when we die we need to go alone you know and we need to go with that mind which we have cultivated to that point and Ajahn Chah you know one of the Thai forest masters of the last century he is on record for having said you know die before you die Die before you die. So when you die, you know, you are not afraid. So the, for us, that means, you know, I mean, fully dying before we die would be, you know, full awakening. But we can work in that direction. And, you know, and one synonym for nirvana is the deathless, actually. The deathless. So... You know, that's my reflections on 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 death or mortality. And before, you know, I lead us in a guided meditation on reflecting on this together. I'm just wondering if any one of you, if you have a comment or maybe a 
clarification or anything, please, you know, raise your hand. Ben, did you want to say something? I was just giving us a heart. Just giving a heart. Okay, good. Thanks. No. I'll, I'll say something. Um, Please. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's so interesting. I, I don't think I've ever, I've, I feel like I've been in classes where people talk about meditation on death and I've sort mm -hmm. of looked at it myself, especially when people who I love have died. But uh, just the way you were describing it today reminded me that um, about it, like 13 years ago, yeah, I had a, a sort of a vision of myself dying. And, and that experience was what led me to eventually um, turn to this turn to this path. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, because I had this feeling like, like I I envisioned myself on my on my you know, quote unquote deathbed, <laughs> and and I was lying there like going, oh no, I blew it. Like, I had this opportunity here to be on Earth, and I blew it. Like I didn't do everything. I didn't fully live somehow. That was the feeling I had. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting chills just saying it. And then, and so then I knew I needed to do something. It took me a while to figure out what, but that was my motivation. Yeah. That makes so much sense, you know, and how did you then, how did you drift here to Buddhism? Well, I'd, I'd, um, I'd been a pretty serious yoga practitioner by then for already a couple of decades. And I, okay. in that, path I experienced some meditation and I always thought oh I should meditate I should meditate I should meditate and then one day I did so that, okay. <laughs> that's it yeah but that's you know that's a real great uh good fortune you know that you had that experience you took it yeah. seriously because yeah. this is exactly one of those five reflections you know yeah 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 yeah, and in the Tibetan tradition it also they have it it's called the four mind turnings you know that is one of the four mind turnings because it turns the mind towards the Dhamma, you know, from looking at the mall as yeah. a place to to get everything you need, you yeah. look at the Dhamma and then you set priorities. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a great example, Noam. Thank you. Yeah. And on the deathbed, it is that, you know, <laughs> that, you know, people who work with the dying, Often people say, you know, that they haven't expressed enough love and appreciation for their loved ones. I'm sorry. <coughs> That's one thing, you know. Or, for example, you know, to accept a person's apology or to go oneself to ask to apologize, you know, those things so that you don't have to deal with it on your deathbed. That's so important. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else of you? Dave or Louise or Amy or Susa Lee? Wanna say something? Dave? Um, I, I, I didn't have a question other than I wanted to express my gratitude for um for you um teaching us today and 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 how valuable this um uh this practice is and to um it's consideration of death has been something that I have um, um, energetically avoided <laughs> uh, yeah. for a really long time. And I'm finding um, value in um, in um, acknowledging that uh, it's it's part of um, you know the leading cause of death is being born. so it's something that I, I can't I can't avoid so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's exactly, you know, if you say that to somebody who has never reflected on the teaching that the mm. real cause for death is that because you're born, they look at you like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's really true. 
Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Okay, so if there no one wants to say something else, then Luis, hello. Oh, uh, hello. I I would like um to know the name of the poet of the reading that you gave. Actually, I know you mentioned. Uh -huh. Yes, let me write it in the chat. Medi Winehouse is his name. Medi Medi Winehouse. Okay, it's there. Hello. Thank you. Okay, you have a beautiful dog, Louise. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, Ben, you you was raising your hand. Yeah, I guess. Um... I guess I've done some attempts to reflect on death. And I guess what I've, what it seems like is that it's a very individual journey in some ways work for some people, some ways work for others. Um, That's true. I, I, I don't know. You might've been alluding to this when you talked about simultaneously holding a survival instinct and the, um, the intellectual knowledge that one day we'll die. Mm -hmm. um, that's, as I understand it, the basis for something that recently people are calling terror management theory. Yeah. Based on the book Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. Okay, so you, you're aware of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so th there's like, <laughs> there's lots of angles to look at it from. And a few years ago, I read the book 4,000 Weeks. It was a New York Times bestseller um, okay. where the author is like, he he looks at a lot of different uh uh ways that mm, yeah effectively like that people's attitudes about death uh lead to them doing things that make no sense unless they were running away from death and this kind of thing uh -huh. i i found that to be a challenging uh i found the book to be great and i found that period where i was trying to sort of focus on death contemplation to be very challenging um partly i guess i guess i now think of it as i was finding the way that was productive for me to relate to death within my current capacity and not go over it yeah that's important yeah 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 to be you know in the in the stretch zone and not go into the panic zone right yeah yeah that's where we want to be, you know, mostly in the stretch zone and then sometimes, you know, resting, comfort zone and, and trying not to get into the panic zone, yeah. 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 And the meditation, you know, which I'm now sharing with you is definitely gentle. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to throw us all into the panic zone, if you can trust me. <laughs> all right. So let's let's do it and then we can speak about it afterwards as well. So you know please you know find a pos position for about like 25 minutes or so. <sighs> In allowing your body you know find its posture. Feeling the weight of the body and the sense of gravity which pulls us towards the earth. And knowing, you know, that we are sitting on this vast planet Earth, which is made up a lot of the dead bodies, you know, like human bodies, animal bodies, bodies of plants and trees, mineral bodies. You know, over a very long, long period of time, they have a reason and gone back into it. 
that's the soil from which our food comes, and our water comes out of it, and our family members, you know, before us have gone into it, and we will go into it too when the time comes. And that stillness and stability of that structure, which is carrying us right now, to the base of where we are right now as uh, Homo sapiens. You know, being willing to live a deeper life with a more, more sense of perspective and context and snapping out of the shopping mall into the universe. And the meditation I'm going to share with us this afternoon, I've learned that from Venerable Big Bodhi, actually. And it has four main themes. The first one is death is inevitable. The second one is the arrival of death is uncertain. The third one is when we die, we have to relinquish everything. And the fourth one is consciousness with its mental disposition will find another body when this body drops away. And the only Thing, quote unquote, we can take with us is actually our mental disposition, the character we have been cultivating. So we're not just going to start with the first of those uh, main themes. And each main theme is broken down into three sub-themes, actually. So the first one, death is inevitable. The first sub-theme is uh, how do we know this? How do we know that death is inevitable? Every other being who lived before me has died. Powerful queens and kings of the past, presidents, the wealthy, the famous, the holy ones, all have died. I can't be an exception. Then the second sub-theme is here, death comes along at the moment of birth. We always think death lies in the future, but actually at the moment I'm born, my death has co-arisen, always lurking in the background. When causes and conditions come, I have to die.
Every moment I'm moving ever closer to death to search something. At morning, when the sun rises, it moves ever closer to sunset. So from birth over the prime of life to old age, ever closer to death every year, every month, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, I draw closer to my death. Then the next sub theme is the arrival of death is uncertain. Time of death is unpredictable. Some beings die in the womb, some die at birth, some die as infants or children, adolescents prime of life, middle age, we don't know when. And the place of my death is unpredictable. Can be you know, in the hospital room, can be in my own bedroom, while driving or while hiking, while being on a boat, on a plane. There's so many, many different ways how it can happen, doing sports, being in a restaurant, simply unpredictable where I'm going to die. And the cause of my death is also unpredictable. Could be old age, could be stroke, cancer, an accident. A fall. Lightning. in a war, simply unpredictable, be also peaceful, you know, in bed, just not waking up. And then the third sub theme is when we have to die, we have to relinquish everything. All material possessions and status. Position, name, fame, 
and all our external acquisitions in our houses, if we have several, our cars, our jewelry, our clothes, our books, everything has to be left behind. Can't take any of it. And all who are near and dear to me as well. We are separated from our parents, our children, our partners and spouses, friends, relatives, Sangha. Be separated from all of them. And then my body and my personality, my whole identity based on that needs to be given up. You know, if I'm whatever, beautiful or strong, smart, sportive, whatever, you know, our trait is, it has to be also given up. Then the fourth sub theme is, is the, you know, we can only take our karmic volitions, the disposition of our character which we have created. This is what we can take with us. This is another message of this practice. This is the only thing we can take with us. This is where we need to put in the effort because that is not going to get lost. Everything else is in service of that cultivation. We need materials, food, and you know we need housing, clothing, all of that. Of course we do. So it needs to just be good enough. You know, for the purpose, how we live, how we 
Well, that work is. So, you know, after we have, you know, looked at those, we can just go one more time, you know, over the main themes. The first one being death is inevitable. Second one, the arrival of death is uncertain. Third one, when we die, we have to relinquish everything. And the fourth one being, you know, the only thing we can take with us is the disposition of our mind. Then, you know, we can bring all of those four together in just one intuitive statement, which is death is inevitable. It's going to happen. And then with the out breath, relaxing into the space around us. And with the in breath, you know, really being aware of what it does to us when we consider those things, those themes. So allowing that really to come close, become intimate with that contemplation. And with the out breath, relaxing into the space. And also you know, taking in the earth underneath us stability and the fact that the earth it is made of many many parts and pieces from previous bodies human ancestors animals plants and trees and minerals the whole you know, long lineage of ancestry, which is just right under us, taking us into the earth. And, you know, the intelligence of this process, where death is part of life and not the end of life. But death is a way, you know, how life continues. And in the animal kingdom, this is just, or in the plant kingdom, it's just a part of the cycle. But for us, it holds a lot of fear. Because we kind of not intimate anymore with this cycle. We have overemphasized certain parts of the mind you know, intellectualizing things so much that we have lost that embeddedness. Even it's still happening, but we have lost connection to it. It's also at the root of the climate crisis. Having lost connection with reality and, you know, using the Buddhist practice to come back because Dharma means nature. Laws of nature. Not in order only, you know, to liberate the man from suffering completely, but also in order to be able to respond to contemporary challenges.
and by you know dropping into a deeper narrative about what we are doing here, who we are. So through, you know, reflecting on death and the fact, you know, that our bodies are deeply dependent and connected with the planet itself, we can tap into this must watch the intelligence, which is self-organizing. You know, open to that intelligence And they're also listening into the silence, which doesn't end at the walls of the room we are sitting in. limitless space and also being aware of that which knows about the limitless space which is also limitless knowing Like a mirror, you know, becoming aware of its capacity to reflect effortlessly. Man can be aware of its capacity to be aware. Then I'm noticing, you know, the mind which doesn't hold on to anything, which is just wide open, sense of the subtle joy or contentment, 
which is present. The freedom of wanting. Freedom from wanting. Then slowly you're coming back into the body again through allowing the breath to take you into the body consciously, feeling the weight of it on the ground, on the cushion, on the chair, on the earth. You know where we are right now and where we have to practice with those limitations and also the wonder of that life you know the mystery where we all come from and where we all return to birth and death birth and death you know until the mind is fully liberated from all ignorance and then what occurs is the deathless no more birth no more death And like slowly, you know, when you're ready, slowly opening your eyes. And you know, if anyone would like to share something about your experience, or maybe clarify something. We have another good 10 minutes. Yeah, Dave, please. Oh, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, um... I uh, sometimes I have um, what feels like a, a, a tension between um, what seems to me to be opposing ideas of, um, on one hand, um, wanting to, um, like a, a, um, a wholesome desire to be fully present, to, 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 to respond um, uh, to, to the moment with, um, um, I guess, I guess, uh, um, um, to be engaged and, and, and to, uh, and to, um, kind of fully be present and respond to the moment. And then also, um, uh, the idea of, of wanting to cultivate the capacity of letting go of, of fully, um, being able to let go and just, um, um, not, uh, be struggling with, with what is and and it feels like a, a tension to me to um um with like intentionality versus letting go good question you know Dave. so you know caring 
for you know for what's happening and in your life you know and where you in your circle of influence you know isn't the same as as not letting go you know what i mean mm-hmm. because it it's because there's right sometimes the question is you know but but if i let go that means you know i don't care but let, it's it's not letting go of caring but it, it's letting go of the result you know of the actions you know which you can take so i think i think one is definitely much more effective you know in in living and acting what is within your scope of influence without being completely you know uh, bogged down by the results you must achieve in order for it you know to be something you want to do so I think that the confusion between caring and uh, you know that not letting go that isn't it doesn't equal not caring you know it's really not that's a misunderstanding. I'm 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 sorry. Um, well, I, I was just thinking that we have this idea of of um, uh, in our culture of fighting death that we we hear of people losing their struggle with cancer or with whatever and and. And we're we're encouraged. It, it seems to to resist to to fight against something that is um, inevitable. And and I I, I feel like I I, um, I would like to cultivate the capacity to know how to respond to the inevitable. You know, the uh, wholesome fighting versus letting go. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, like, let's say I get a diagnosis for some illness, then I'll see what is within the scope, you know, of what I can do, certain treatments, certain medication, even, you know, like some cancer treatments and so on. And then at one point, when he hears that again and again from people, you know, they they do something, they they take treatments and so on. At one point, they stop, you know. And some and, and for some people they do one treatment and it goes it's it's gone you know so you, you never know I think you know for yourself I'm sure if you're listening to your heart you know you know what is enough you know whatever it is if it's an illness or, or anything else you know which was once maybe a big part of my life and then you know it became kind of a bit overshaped and then for some time I would try to you know, make it, bring it back to balance and bring it back to balance and bring it back to balance. And at one point I feel like, no, it's not worth the struggle. It's just over, you know? And I think we will definitely, you know, needs to try and, and just be reflecting and really listening deeply, I think, and maybe also discussing it with others, you know, who, who are on the same, same wavelength. Things can shift, you know. There is no clear, you know, this is the thing, that there is no clear answer like black and white, which is like a blanket answer. It's totally individual. And what might be right for me might not be right for someone else and vice versa, you know. But to really to really take stock and look inside and, and don't feel you have to fulfill anyone's I mean, there will be maybe, you know, if, if one is in very close relationship with someone who is dependent on one, like a child or so, one might really hang in there, you know, until they have graduated or whatever, you know, it takes. That makes all sense to me, you know. That sometimes one might do it for somebody else, you know, a child or, or a spouse or so, because one knows that would be better for them, you know? And then one would like to leave behind an as good situation as possible for them, you know? That I can totally imagine, you know? But then that would also be the best for oneself because of the love one has, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Dave, uh, for bringing that up. Thank you, Aya.
Well, any any anybody else you want to share something? Your Ben, I think I know you from somewhere. Where did I meet you at a New Year's retreat or where was it? Yeah, I did the New Year's retreat 2017 to 18. And um, I then saw you at um, Against the Stream turned San Francisco Dharma Collective when I lived in San Francisco. And I've been dialing into a bunch of these online ones. Okay, that's fine. And I also think I've heard you uh, guide a very similar meditation because I listen to your Dharma seat in the car sometimes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Nice to hear that. Yeah, this year we teach the New Year's retreat again in the in, in Auburn after several years of stopping, you know, because of COVID. So, yeah. Well, friends, you know, if there's nothing else to be said, then I'll hand back over to Noam. And, you know, this was a pleasure, you know, to have my last monthly teaching at SFTC. And then we have a day long next year, April 28th. It's going to be hybrid. So if any one of you want to join in, that would be lovely. And I hand over to Noam and I kind of disappear. Bye-bye, Noam. Happy New Year. See you next year. Thank you so much, Santajita. Bye. Have a good one.